The speaker can have as much time uh, as he wishes. However, uh, most of you know the Pomeranian Bookstore has cooperated with us in some of these and other programs that we've had in terms of book launches. Michael is the child, uh, second generation child of a survivor, and he has made it one of his life's marks to make sure that we remember. And that's what this program is all about. The books that he deals with, deals with this subject, all to make sure that we do not forget. In 1938, there was the Anschluss. Germany took over Austria. March 12th, the Germans marched into Austria. April 10th, there was a plebiscite, a vote. 99.9, 9, 99.7% 9 of Austrians voted in favor of merging with Nazi Germany. Austria, in 1938, ceased to be a sovereign state. I was born in Vienna in 1932. We lived in a small little village outside of Vienna called Kitsay, one of the Shemek Kegelos, for those of you who are familiar with European Jewish history. The Germans came into Kitsay the first night of Pesach. They made all of the Jews. I remember seeing my father. It's a memory that is so vivid that I can almost hear the events. They had to scrub all the floors of the village. They did, then took the entire Jewish community, which was about 129 souls, rode us across halfway through the Danube. <coughs> and it was low tide, so there was a sandbar. And they dropped us on the sandbar. Men, women, and little children. I was six years old. David Makovsky, who wrote a book on Winston Churchill, speaks a lot about the first major speech that Churchill made in the House of Commons, deploring Hitler's behavior. How could a human being leave men, and women, and children on a sandbar knowing that the tide was coming in? Fortunately, we escaped that evening rescued. We ended up in Hungary. The Hungarians put us on a barge, an old coal barge, that was uh, docked in the, on the Danube River. We were there for a long period of time. And I don't want to go into all of the details because I'm certainly not the speaker tonight, but one of the great miracles that took place was that my father, Olaf Shalom, was able to rescue a safe Torah that had been stolen away from the Germans. A German soldier had desecrated that safe Torah and with a bayonet made a cut. The cut was made on Shemot, chapter 1, verse 12. The Ka'asha Yanuosa, Ken Yirba, the Ken the more the Egyptians oppressed them, they became stronger and flourished. A German soldier slashed that one point. For a long time, Jews suffered. The killing machine began. And then in 1942, Jews collectively said, enough is enough. And they decided to fight the Nazi regime. January 18, 1943, the war 
Warsaw Rebellion began. They were able to hold out until May 16th, when they were all essentially slaughtered. What an incredible zuchus it is for us to sit here tonight understanding that at that moment when the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising began, that was the spark for which the State of Israel was created. We vowed never again. And Israel has kept that promise. We have a schuss tonight, an incredible privilege to listen to a man who embodies that concept. He was foreign minister, defense minister, I believe, three times, if I'm correct. Known throughout the world, so I don't have to give you a CV. It's a real privilege for me to introduce and I think for this audience, on the evening of Yom show, to listen to the Honorable Moshe Adams. Good evening. It's uh, Erev Yom HaShoah. We refer to it in Israel as uh, Yom HaShoah al Bora, the day of the Holocaust and the day of heroism. The date was picked so as to be to fall onto or be close to the day on which the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising broke out. That was the 19th of April, 1943. And as it turns out, tomorrow is the 19th of April. And it will be 69 years since the outbreak of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. A very important event in the history of the Holocaust. Not the only event. There were six million events during that period. Men, women, and children. An important event in Jewish history, an important event in the history of World War II. There isn't a book about World War II that does not assign considerable space to the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, the first uprising of major proportions against the Germans during World War II. Day, the day in Hebrew is called Yom HaShoah al-Moran because it seemed important at the time that next to the catastrophe, next to the destruction, next to the extermination of six million Jews, the accent should also be put on Quran, on the heresy, on the resistance. There was a time in the first two years after the end of World War II, in the establishment of the state, where people here talked about the fact that six million Jews were led like a sheep to slaughter. We don't use that expression anymore. Because it might insinuate even a certain disrespect for six million men and women who went to their death. And the question arises <coughs> under what circumstances was it at all possible to resist the German war machine? On the one hand, the German army, the most powerful army in Europe at the time, with their associates, Ukrainians, and Latvians, and Lithuanians, armed 
and Jewish civilians, men, women, and children, unarmed. Parents concerned about being able to save their children. Young men, men and women being concerned about protecting their parents or their grandparents. How were they going to resist? And nobody came to their assistance. And so there are only very special circumstances that made it possible to resist. Two very special conditions that would set the foundation for a resistance movement. The first was that the Jewish population in the ghetto in which resistance was planned, that the Jewish population in the ghetto would support resistance. Now that's not at all obvious. Not considering the dem demonic measures the Germans took to lead people to believe that not everybody was going to be killed. That some would survive. That those who were considered to be productive and working in the shops for the German war effort, that they could survive the war. They and their families. Also, there was always the hope that you could make it, that you and your children might be able to make it. So when some young people, some hotheads came along with the idea that this should be organized, the intuitive reaction was, this will bring destruction onto all of us. What chance do we have against the Germans? And their response is going to be to kill everybody. And the outstanding example is what happened in the Vilna government. Vilna, here the enemy is a great Jewish community. Bill had been under Soviet rule as a result of the partition of Poland between Germany and the Soviet Union, as a result of the Molotov Ribbentrop Pact. And when in Operation Barbarossa, the Germans invaded the Soviet Union on June 22, 1941. That, by the way, is the date where the mass killings really began. Jews were fallen under German rule in September of 1939. Until that time, in the summer of 1941, were put into ghettos, were humiliated, were starved, lived under terrible conditions, but the, the mass killings, the mass killings began in June of 1941. In went the German army. Behind them, the Einsatz Gruppen, especially trained SS troops, who the task to kill the Jews. Recently, we remember the Banzai Conference in February of 1942, and some people mistakenly identified with the decision to exterminate the Jewish people of Europe under, the, under German rule. But that was just a bureaucratic conference assigning tasks to different departments. The killing began in June of 1941. Not in gas chambers, they hadn't been set up yet by bullets, by rounding up men, women, and children, and shooting them, and dropping them into pits. 
And that happened in Wilma. And within that first half year, in a community of 70,000 Jews, 35,000 were murdered. Any of you who have been to Vilna, may have been to Ponar, that wooded area next to Vilna, where the killing took place. The Jews of Vilna were shocked. It took some time for them to realize what was happening and the scale of what was happening. And in Vilna, the first organization with the aim of resisting the Germans took form in the winter of 1941-42. It was the youth groups who were at the center of this organization. The leader that was chosen to head the organization in Frank, the Partizan Organization, the United Partisan Organization, and united it was, unlike what happened in the Warsaw Ghetto later on, it included all the Zionist groups from left to right, it included the Bund, it included the Communists. The head of the organization was chosen, Issy Wittenberg, the Communist. And we can imagine that the reason that the Communist was chosen, the head of this organization, the organization, that with a Communist leader or commander, it would be easier to make contact with the Red Army and obtain assistance from the Soviets. And he had two deputies. One was Josef Rosman, who had been the head of Bektar in Lithuania before the war, and the other was Abu Kovner, who was the head of Hashemina Seyir in the city of Warsaw before the war. It was Abu Kovner who maybe saw farther and clearer than anybody else at that time for some time to come. Because at the meeting that took place on the 31st of December, in Vilna under the guise of a New Year, New Year festivities, he said the Germans are out to kill all the Jews in the areas of their control. And he said, we, the Lithuanian Jews, are first in line. And then he used that expression that, as I said, years or after we tended not to refer to. He says, Let us not go like sheep to the slaughter. The only path for us is to resist. The only honorable path for us is to resist. And the organization, FPO, began acquiring weapons began training people, organizing cells, small units. <coughs> and you probably know that in the Vilna Ghetto, there was no uprising. So what happened in Vilna? Isaac Wittenberg, the head of the organization, had made contact with Communists outside the ghetto, Poles, Lithuanians, the Gestapo had gotten a hold of one of them, managed to find out from him, by means we can easily imagine, that there was a man in the ghetto, Hitsi Wittenberg, who was heading a resistance organization, an underground resistance organization. And the Germans came to the Judenrat and they said, you must turn over Isaac Wittenberg within the next 24 hours or else we're going to destroy the entire town. Those 30,000 who had survived Fanar 
Many of them working in the shops that have been established felt they were facing imminent destruction. And people said, we're not going to sacrifice the lives of everybody here because of one man. And they said to the Unrod, you have to turn him over. And Issy Gutenberg was in hiding. And we can just imagine the scenes of people running through the ghetto, Jews looking for Gutenberg. Because they felt that their lives and the lives of their children were not stuck. And Gutenberg decided to turn himself over. His own decision. Nobody was going to tell him to do that. Certainly not in the resistance organization. He turned himself over, took poison, and so the Germans didn't have a chance to torture him. But the members of the resistance organization realized then and there that in Vilma, in the Vilma ghetto, there was not going to be an uprising. Because the uprising would not be backed by the people living in the ghetto. An uprising that was supposed to be an uprising for the people in the ghetto. So that is the first condition. That the people in the ghetto would support an uprising. Would not oppose it. That condition was not met in Vilna. Now when the organization in Vilna was set up in the winter of 41, 42, one thing that concerned them was that nobody knew. Now these, are, these were not the days of the internet where news was communicated instantaneously. They said the Germans are killing thousands, tens of thousands, and maybe nobody knows. Not only maybe no, nobody knows in New York, or nobody knows in Jerusalem, maybe nobody knows in Warsaw. Also in the German occupation. And they sent four young people, Two from Beitar and one from Shemir Asair and one from Dror to Warsaw, to the Warsaw Ghetto, in order to tell the people in the Warsaw Ghetto that the Germans are killing the Jews in massive numbers. They came to the Warsaw Ghetto, they met with leading personalities, representatives of the different political organizations. They told them what was happening in Vilna and in other areas in the surroundings. And they said the same thing is going to happen in Warsaw. We are organizing a resistance organization, and you better start going inside. Now many didn't believe them. Didn't want to believe them. Thought they were exaggerated. Couldn't possibly be true. And others said, well, maybe it's happening in Vilna. Maybe it's happening in the areas that had been under Soviet occupation before the Germans moved in. This cannot happen in Warsaw. Warsaw, the largest Jewish community in the areas of German rule, the largest Jewish community before the war next to the Jewish community of New York, and what they considered to be in the center of Europe, it could not possibly happen here. That was in January of 1942. On the Shabbat of 1942, the end of July, German officers came to the Judenrat in Warsaw, and informed the head of the Judenrat, a man named Adam Chernikov, that as of that day, 
8,000 Jews, men, women, and children, would have to be assembled at the railroad siding, Yumshak Platz, those who have been to Warsaw have probably seen it, to be transported to the east. <coughs> First day, General Kov and his people in the Jewish police followed the instructions, rounded up 8,000 people. They came to the Umschlag Platz, onto the trains, and off they went. Where were they going? Nobody knew. When Chenyakov on the second day saw that they were shipping out not only men, but women and children, he said to himself, these people are not being sent to work. Could it possibly be? And he committed suicide. But there were his associates in the Udrat, in the Jewish police, that followed the orders of the Germans. And every day, day after day, assembled 8,000, on some days 10,000, men, women, and children at the railroad sidings to be shipped, up, shipped off in the cattle cars. Where were they going? Well, took a little bit of intelligence work and questioning Polish railroad workers before they found out that they were going to Treblinka. And that Treblinka was a death camp. And they were going to death. And the railroad cars were returning empty to take on the next shipment the following day. So day after day, from Tisha B'Av until Yom Kippur, seven weeks, 270,000 Jews, men, women, and children were shipped from the Warsaw Ghetto to Trumanka. And there was no resistance. Some of the young people talked about the need to get organized, to resist. But every day, those that had survived to that day said, maybe today is the last shipment. And they're certainly not going to ship out people who work in the shops. And maybe those who have remained until today have a chance of surviving. If there were to be resistance, Everybody will be destroyed. And it was only after Yom Kippur. Only 50,000 Jews remaining in the ghetto. When it became clear to everybody in the ghetto that all of them were destined to be killed. That resisting was not risking anything because they're going to, they were going to be killed anyway. And that the conditions were set, that first condition, that resistance would have the support of the people in the ghetto for resistance to become effective. For those who were prepared to resist, to also be prepared to take upon themselves the responsibility of rising up against the Germans. The second condition for resistance was that there be leadership. That there would be somebody to lead the way. Now the leadership of Polish Jewry left Warsaw as the German army approached in September of 1939. Poland, as you know, had a great Jewish community. It had all the entire spectrum of Jewish organizations. Zionists from left to right, the Bund, the great Yiddish socialist anti-Zionist organization, 
the ultra-orthodox of Ibn Israel. They had, the, had their headquarters in Warsaw. They had their leadership in Warsaw. And as you can well understand, nobody had the famous notion of what was in store for Polish Jewry in the years to come. As you can well understand, as the German army approached, they left Warsaw. The result was that the Polish Jewry, in fact, was left leaderless during several years of the Holocaust. <coughs> so who were the leaders? The youth groups. The youth groups were organized. The youth groups had soldiers. Not real soldiers, but soldiers in quotation marks. Youngsters, girls, and boys who were prepared to follow the instructions of their instructors. And when their instructors told them the time is done, the war weapons, the train to prepare for military resistance to Germans, there were young people who were prepared to follow these orders. So ordinarily, we don't think of young people, 18, 19, 20, 23, when Levitch was 23 years old, Pablo Franco was 23 years old. Ordinarily, we don't think of people that age leading a nation or leading a community. As I said, the known leaders, the elected leaders of the Jewish community in Warsaw and Poland were not there. So it fell on the shoulders of the youngsters, of the youngsters. Now the youth groups in those days, far less of today, were highly ideologically motivated. And as a result, there was great rivalry between them. Rivalry that, rivalry that sometimes was animosity. And in some cases, it became hate. Now, when you think back to the years before World War II, the years of the Civil War in Spain, the years of the struggle, the class struggle, between the workers, the proletarians, and the capitalists, the same struggle was taking place in Palestine as well, in the end before the war. Class struggle between the workers, Eretz Israel all about it. Nowadays people hardly know what their term could have meant. The workers, as against the bourgeois, against the capitalists, against the adherents of Jabotinsky. And that rivalry and that animosity came to a peak when in 1933, Chaim Lozarov, great leader of the labor movement, was murdered on the Kalabay beach. And Jabotinsky's adherents were accused of having, having uh, murdered him. They were not only representatives of the capitalist class, they were not only fascists, they were also murderers. Now what does this have to do with the Warsaw Ghetto? With the years of the Holocaust? But in the Warsaw Ghetto, the youth groups continued to teach their youngsters, give them the same indoctrination that they had been giving them years before the war. They didn't, read, didn't receive instructions from the parent organizations in Palestine to change course, and all this was completely irrelevant. So when it came to organizing resistance, those from the socialist camp looked for partners in what they called the proletarian camp, not the adherents of Jabotinsky, not the members of Beitar. The social Zionists, the Shemel Zahir, they turned to the Bund. A 
socialist organization, fellow proletarians, not Zionists, but fellow proletarians. They turned to the communists. And that is out of a federation of what they call the Zion proletarian organizations, the Jewish spying organization, Irgun Yudhi Ruchem, that was led by Mordechai and Levitch, was formed. And that's how it turned out that in the Warsaw Ghetto, there were two resistance organizations, not one. The question is frequently asked, why did they unite? And I'll talk about that in a minute. So the first question that needs to be addressed is how did it start with two organizations? Why did it start as one? And as I said, it will not be started as one, but not in Warsaw. And so here was one organization led by Mordechai Levitch, included all the, what we today might call the leftist groups in the ghetto, and on the other side, an organization that was led by the adherents of Jabotinsky, among whose members were many who did not belong to any organization, were not affiliated with anyone, but who were welcomed into the ranks of the Jewish military organization that was led by Pablo Franco. It's not surprising to find that the people who had grown up in Beitar, some of whom had been members of the Ergunstein army, chapters of which had been organized in Poland in the years before the war, by Shechem, by emissaries that came from Palestine, had some paramilitary training, others military training had a mindset that was oriented towards activism, towards taking military action, who were prepared mentally, also in terms of their background, for organizing a military organization that would take action against the Germans. In the months leading up to the 19th of April, to the outbreak of the uprising, they began to negotiate about uniting the two organizations. The leaders of both organizations realized the consensus facing the Germans, outmanned and outgunned, in effect facing certain death. What sense does it make to do this in two separate organizations? But it didn't work out. Once the two organizations were already established, with their own units, their own commanders, their own positions, it became next to impossible to put the two together. Primarily because the organization led by Malachan Levitch was in large measure a political organization, a federation of political groups. His high command was not composed of those who were most capable in military matters. His high command was composed of representatives of Shemir Asayir, of the Bon, of Dror, of the Communists, of the different organizations that were part and parcel of his organization. Now, for them to unite with the group led by Bekar, for them to recognize that Paolo Franco militarily was the most qualified man around to head a united organization was politically impossible. We know for certain that the Bund would never agree to it. And so the result was that the Warsaw Ghetto, in the Warsaw Ghetto uprising, we had two organizations fighting the Germans. In both groups there were discussions in the months leading up to the uprising as to whether they should go out to join the partisans, leave the ghetto, or whether the fight should take place in the ghetto itself. Now going out to the partisans was the easier path, not easy by any means. 
in our home may have to contend with the conditions in the woods, in the forests, in the swamps, the physical conditions. They also have to contend with the Polish underground, Ukrainians, who frequently would disarm the Jews, kill the Jews that wanted to join them, wanted to join the Partisans. But it was a chance to survive. It was a chance to take action against the Germans and a chance to survive. And many of those who were with the Partisans did survive the Holocaust, did survive the war. But the young people in the Warsaw Ghetto, in both organizations, decided that they wanted to fight the battle to take place within the confines of the ghetto. They wanted it to be known as a battle for the honor of the Jewish people. They felt they were fighting for a page in history. And even though they faced certain death, and most of them died during the uprising, in that sense, they won. That patient history exists as a result of the uprising in the Warsaw Ghetto. Now it turned out, I insinuated what the reasons were, that the organization led by Paul Frankel, a man who was almost unknown, was better prepared, was better armed, chose a more effective tactic in fighting the Germans than the organization led by Anna Levinstein. Don't in any way belittle the heroism of Anna Levinstein and the people that fought with him. But he decided that they would put the emphasis on Ambushes against German forces on attacking the men by surprise and then withdrawing and taking shelter in one of the many bunkers that had been built in the Warsaw Ghetto. Frankel decided to concentrate his main force in a location called Malinowski Square. We have a sign up in that location today in Warsaw. If you go to Warsaw, you can see it. Although of course, everything has changed more so. To establish positions there and to face the Germans promptly as they approach the area. As a symbol of the uprising, they raised the Zionist flag, the flag of Israel, and the Polish flag at the top of one of the tallest buildings in the square. The flags were seen far and wide. That is the reason why the name of my book is Flags of the Warsaw Ghetto. That was the symbol of the uprising. And there, in Koronovsky Square, took place the battle that lasted for four days. Himmler sent instructions for the flags to be taken down at all costs. The Germans were afraid that the flags might incite the Poles as well to join the fighting. That did not happen. But they spared no expense, no casualties to try to bring down these flags. So amongst the various events that took place during the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, the central event, the major battle, if we can call it such, of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising in Medvedev, Russia, was the battle in Moronovsky Square. That's where most of the Jewish casualties fell, and that's where most of the German casualties fell. They had some heavy equipment, they had some machine guns. The standard weapon was a pistol. And you know how effective a pistol can be when you face the soldiers with automatic weapons. But they had managed to bring two machine guns into the ghetto, some rifles, and so there was a battle going on uh, at Moronovsky Square as part of the uprising. That, in short, is the story of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, the glorious page in the history of the Jewish people. And so people will ask, 
especially considering the fact that this is not the narrative that is generally known. Well, how do you know? Now, it's true that Paul Frankel fell in battle against the Germans. That all the senior people of his organization fell in battle against the Germans. And in fact, nobody from the organization who was known, whose voice would be heard, if they didn't manage to survive, survive. The story, the narrative, as we have learned it, as we've heard it, as it has been studied by children in school, is the narrative of the organization led by Mordechai Novich. There isn't a town or city in Israel that does not have its feet named after Mordechai Novich, and rightly so. But who has ever heard of Paul Frankel? So how do you know? But it turns out that the most solid piece of evidence of what happened in the Warsaw Ghetto in those desperate days are the battle communiques that were written by the German general who had been charged by Hitler to destroy the ghetto. SS General Jürgen Schmutt, an animal who took pride in chasing Jews while you chase rats. A military man who issued communiques every day, sometimes twice a day, they were passed on to his superiors, all the way to Himmler and presumably also to Hitler. And when we go through his communiques, it's clear. The major battle, the major problem that he faced was in Muranovsky's form. How do we know about these communiques? Well, they were introduced as evidence in the Nuremberg war crimes trial. Jürgen Stuck was captured by American forces in Western Germany at the end of the war. He had been stationed there after completing the destruction of the Warsaw Ghetto. He received the Iron Cross for his heroism in commanding that operation. And he was brought to trial in the Nuremberg trials because he had given orders to execute American airmen who had fallen as prisoners at the end of the war. His communiques were introduced as evidence at the Nuremberg War Crimes War Crime Trials, translated in English. They've also been translated into Hebrew, into Polish, and it's all there. Some people would say, well, do you think that's true? could tell the difference between an electoral organization and Frankel's organization? Well, the fact of the matter is that he did. Because they captured people, they captured fighters, they interrogated them using methods that we know they use, then they killed them. And they found that some said we belong to this organization, the others said we belong to their organization. So you realize that there were two fighting organizations in the ghetto. Sometimes he got them mixed up when he located the bunker of Mila 18, the bunker in which Mordechai Levich was hiding, together with another hundred fighters of his organization. You read his communication, he thought that he had located the headquarters of Paul Franklin's organization. But when it came to locating the battles, the areas in which he had his biggest problem, there's no doubt, more enough to score. He was sentenced to death uh, in the Nuremberg trials, and actually his trial took place in Dachau. But the Polish government insisted that he be sent to Poland that he'd be extradited, and they wanted to put him on trial for war crimes in the Warsaw Ghetto. So he was sent to Warsaw, 
And while he was in prison, he was away in his trial. There he was sentenced to death again. And he was hanged in the area of the Warsaw Ghetto. While he was awaiting trial, three people who had been in the Warsaw Ghetto had the opportunity to interrogate him. And we have the stenographic record of these conversations. One of the three was Mark Edelman. You may have read about him recently, a book about him, originally published in Polish, has recently been published in Hebrew. He was a, the representative of the Bund in an electric organization, a fighter in the Warsaw Ghetto, a courageous man, a Bundist to the end. Never wanted to come inside of Israel. And Adam had met Shrub in the prison. He said, The word that you have, the most difficulty in fighting the uprising. And Shrub said to him, In Maranovsky Square. So, how is it that the narrative that we have learned, that we have read, that our children, I studied in school that people throughout the world have heard or read about in Leon Yoris' book, Be Like Dean, in John Hirsch's book, The Wall. How is it that this is only half the story? And Elevich, as I mentioned, as you all know, uh, died in Be Like Dean, committed suicide. To the best of our knowledge, there were two people from his organization that were well known, who survived, who came to Palestine after the war, before the state of Israel was established, and they provided a narrative of what happened in the Warsaw Ghetto. They were not the children. Antik Zuckerman had been the deputy of Mechaim Levich. He had not been in the ghetto during the fighting because he had been sent outside the ghetto to make contact with the Polish underground in the hope of being able to get some assistance from them. And on the 19th of April, Erev Pesach, he wanted to come back into the ghetto to spend the Seder in the ghetto. He found the ghetto was closed, the fire had begun, and he couldn't come back out. Sylvia Rubetkin, who married Zuckerman, was a fighter in the ghetto. Both were members of war, <coughs> socialist Zionist group organization. Both were well-known personalities, especially Sylvia Rubetkin, in Palestine as well. Sylvia Rebetkin had been a delegate to the last Zionist Congress that took place in August of 1939 in Geneva. People here, Busan Mouchad, they knew of her. She had been in contact by mail with the representatives of the Chalutz who had an office in Geneva. She and Zuckerman survived came to Palestine and they told and retold the story of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. Half the story. Now if we find it difficult to understand how you could have had this kind of political partisanship in the ghetto in those desperate days, it is not hard to understand why after the war, in 1946, there would be political partisanship <coughs> that reflected, reflected the history of what happened in the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. Zuckerman and Sigurd Rebellion returned, came to Palestine in 1946. And that year we had what we refer to as the Saddam. 
the manhunt conducted by members of the Haganah and orders from the Jewish establishment of people from the Iran. And people were turned over to the British. So it's no surprise that people here are not interested in the establishment, in hearing about the heroism of members of Beitar or people associated with the Iran in the Warsaw Ghetto. And Sokrman and Sidney Lubetkin were eager to show that it was their organization, that it was their information, that it was their young people who rose to the challenge, who were the heroes of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. So that is a story that was told. It is now 69 years. Three weeks ago, on the street in Warsaw, after having received the approval of the Polish government and the municipality of Warsaw, we put a plaque up at the location where Papa Franco and nine of his fighters died in a gunfight with the Germans. 69 years after it happened. Next year is going to be 70 years since the outbreak of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. I'm sure it will be a very great event attended by many notables, probably the Prime Minister of Israel and the Prime Minister of Poland. And slowly, slowly, we are beginning to set the record straight. Is it important? I think it's very important that an event of such great historical importance be known as best as we can reconstitute. George Orwell, in his book, uh, 1984, describing that country or model after the Soviet Union, run by a single party, which proclaimed Whoever controls the present, controls the past. Now we know that Bolsheviks, the Communists in the Soviet Union, they believe in that. The subscribers of the Soviet Encyclopedia used to receive every year a list of pages that had to be torn out of the Encyclopedia and replaced by other pages that were being mailed to them. Those who control the present, control the past, and fashion it in accordance with their ideological principles. And we had some of that, we had some of that, even here in our own country. During a number of years, when the Labour Party was in power continuously, and dominated the entire scene, including the education of our children. Now, Paolo Franco, a few days before the uprising, spoke to an assembly of his fighters, and it was reported that he said, we are going to die young, but we are not doomed, because children and the Jewish state that will be established in Palestine will learn about our battle here in the Warsaw Ghetto. Well, that has not yet happened, but I hope it is going to happen. Thank you very much. Thank you for helping us to remember Thank you for helping us to remember and to know everything that took place. Before the evening began, a half a dozen people came over to me with the same question. He was Minister of Defense three times. He was Foreign <coughs> Ambassador of Israel to the United States. He must know what's going on. Could you ask him one question? I'm going to be presumptuous and indeed ask you one question. 
what comments do you have on our current situation? <laughs> You want a short answer or a long answer? Long, long. Well, first of all, we can, I think, take great satisfaction and pride, especially on Nadia Yamashah, to say to ourselves that Israel is a very strong country. And Israel has a very fine army, Saab. No disrespect meant for other armies, but this is an army in which serve some very smart Jewish boys and girls. When uh, we look at the situation in Iran and we talk about a military strike and who would carry it out, the United States or Israel, and I'm not going to uh, uh, talk about that, express my opinion on that, but I think it is important to point out that there are only two countries in the world that have the ability to deliver an effective strike against the Iranian nuclear capability. The United States and Israel, the only countries in the world that have that ability. So uh, that really is, I think, the first thing we want to think about when we think about the situation that faces us today, the problems that we face today, some of the risks we might be taking or might be coming our way. Israel is strong. I think Israel is capable of meeting the challenges as we see them. And uh, I don't want to conclude my answer to your question by saying there's nothing to worry about. We always worry, you know. But uh, I think that we can look at the future with considerable confidence. The book is available downstairs. Buy it. It should be on your shelves. Every Jewish home should have this book. Uh, it's a special evening tonight. The eve of Yom Hashoah. There's a special tefillah. I'm going to ask Rabbi Finkelstein to come up and read. Following uh, the program, we'll have a marriage service. Shekola Koho, 
Mispalel inui nishmoseem Pigan eden te menufoson Locherin balwarachamim Yazkireim Bisekser kinafov liolomim Veyitzro question. The untold story, why is it told so late? That's a question I'd like to know. Well, that's what I got around to. Now, maybe somebody else should have gotten yeah, That's what I'm asking you. The town people should have said that 20 years ago. At least it's being told. Hmm? It's good told. Uh, that's why I'm asking the question. Why so late? Okay. 